Well, hello, Paleo FX tribe. It's good to be back, back in the saddle. I'm Keith North, co founder and owner of Paleo FX. And today it's my special and distinct pleasure to have Dr. Stephen Gundry on the line. Dr. Gundry, how are you doing, sir? Keith, good to be with you today. Outstanding. And uh, if you don't know, Dr. Gundry is the director of the International Heart and Lung Institute in Palm Springs, California, and he is the founder and director of the Center of Restorative Medicine in Palm Springs in Santa Barbara. Um, I was talking with Dr. Gundry just a second ago before we went live, and I could suck up an entire 15 or 20 minutes reading this gentleman's entire resume. I won't do that. Um, let's just say he is uh, smarter than 99.9% .9 of us. Um, it probably has a lot more experience than many of us. And an interesting aside, Dr. Gundry just flew back today from Ethiopia where he was digging wells, which is, I think, one of the most fascinating things to dive into. And I think, Dr. Gundry, let's start there because it, as we talked about before, before I hit the, uh, the liftoff switch here, it's one thing to donate money to a good cause quite another to donate time and physical labor to a good cause. So kudos to you for doing that. Can you tell us a little bit about this uh, about this charitable organization? Yeah, this uh, this organization is called Charity Water. Um, and you can find it on the internet. You can find it on Facebook. Uh, you can find it on Instagram. And it's an organization that uh, was founded by Scott Harrison uh, a few years ago to uh, just real briefly um, you wouldn't believe the number of people in this world who do not have access to clean water. And just to give you an example in Ethiopia, Ethiopia is a country of 110 million people. And 85% of the people in Ethiopia are subsistence farmers who have no access to running water or electricity. And the women, and the girls have to, on average, walk two hours each way to a dirty pond or stream where I witnessed, you know, cows and goats and sheep defecating in the stream. And the women were pouring this water into 40 pound jerry cans, putting it on their back and then walking two hours to bring it back to their home. And they have to do that two to three hours, two to three times a day, which means the women can't go to school, the girls can't go to school. And we actually, we were drilling wells for these people. Uh, but one of the things that we wanted to experience, we carried that water, my wife and I, those two hours on our backs just to get the enormity of what what that actually means and it, it's it's unbelievable that this is happening in you know 2019 right and what does that mean to you as a practitioner dr gundry when you when you see the extremes like so there's one extreme that is an extreme of lack and then you come back to the us where we have the other extreme that's causing ill health as well that's quite the juxtaposition yeah these these guys are actually all very skinny uh, but if you look at the, the number one mortality of children in Ethiopia and actually the third world is infectious diarrhea. It's the leading cause of death of infants and children. And when I saw why that, why that was, and one of the reasons Scott Harrison started with this is he actually started on a hospital ship. And he started talking to the doctors uh, in Africa, and they said, you know, it's wonderful that you can do operations and take care of people, but if we could do one thing to stop all this, is that if we could get these people clean water, half of the things that we end up doing as doctors or surgeons would be preventable. So that's actually why I started with this program. I've done missionary operations around the world in third world countries. But just the enormity of what clean water could fix for individuals is is unbelievable. So, right. And do you do we have a common friend in Paul Sullivan? I've just thought about. Yeah. It. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Great. So, uh, Paul Sullivan, for people who who might not be aware, was the actual developer of ID Nutrition's um, epigenetic um, assessment. 
that we use for assessing uh, nutrient intake and nutrient demand. And also, um, he's a developer of a screen that looks at uh, nutraceutical interactions with, with uh, pharmaceuticals. And many doctors don't realize that there is an interaction there. And sometimes those interactions can be uh, pretty, pretty major. And it's just more than a doctor can can handle to keep all that, you know, with everything else they have to juggle to keep that in mind as well as they're prescribing. So um, and the reason Paul Sullivan comes up is because we at at ID Life have a have a program set up to where we ship um, hydrate, which uh, you can think of as a very, very healthy form of, of Gatorade or Pedialyte um, to to countries in Africa for people who are recovering from diarrhea and these types of issues and to give them the proper hydration and proper electrolyte levels. So I, I just, I just connected those dots as we were, as we were talking about your time in Ethiopia. So small very, world. Small yeah, world, yeah. very, very small world. So Dr. Gundry, tell us a little bit about how you came into, uh, to this type of medicine. So you were a, a very, very accomplished heart surgeon. Do I have that right? Transplant surgeon. And right. yep. you happen to have a, a um, client or a patient rather, client, a patient rather, who has is, who is, had inoperable um, coronary disease, if I have this right. And right. can you pick right. up the story from there? Yeah, about uh, 20 years ago, I was a professor and chairman of cardiothoracic surgery at Loma Linda University, one of the blue zones, and a very famous heart surgeon who uh, took on people who were inoperable. There were, are a few of us who like to do that. And uh, this gentleman, uh, who I call Big Ed in all my books, um, was from Miami, Florida, and he was truly big. Uh, when I met him, he was 265 well, pounds. It looks like we lost Dr. Gundry, the wonders of the internet age. Sometimes it works, oh, sometimes no. it trips up. We'll hope to have uh, Dr. Gundry back on here in assessment. And I hate we lost him right in the middle of that story because it's a fabulous story. Um, let's funny. see if we I can see get Dr. Okay. Gundry back. Mm -hmm. I see you just... Fine. By the way, if you have any uh, any questions for Dr. Gundry, just drop them right down there in the comments section. We'll be glad to get to them. Frank, how you doing, sir? It's good to see you on as always. Let me. And I'm yeah, gonna stop. Frank, I love that assessment as well. I think it's a it's fabulous. I think Stephen's coming back on here in just a sec. There he is. He's back. So I started and restopped. So we'll see if we can get you. We got it. We got it. So we were talking about Big Ed. Yeah. So Big Ed, uh, 30, 48 years old, big giant, 265 pounds. When I met him, he had inoperable coronary artery disease. That means you couldn't put stents in him. You couldn't put bypasses in him. He'd been going around the country looking for surgeons who had taken him on over six months. Nobody would take him on. When I met him, uh, I said, boy, I agree with everybody else. I can't help you. And he said, yeah, but let me tell you what I've been doing. I've gone on a diet. I've lost 45 pounds in six months. And I went to a health food store. And I've been taking a bunch of supplements. And he brings in a giant shopping bag of supplements. And I go, well, you know, good for you for losing weight, but that's not going to help. And I know what you did with all those supplements. You made expensive urine, which I <laughs> truly believed back then. So the guy says, well, look, uh, you've come all this way. Why don't we get a new angiogram of my heart, new coronary artery angiogram, movie? Maybe I did something. So we did. And this guy in six months time cleans out 50% of the blockages in his coronary arteries, gone. Uh, now he still had some blockages, but now there were places I could do bypasses. So I actually did a five vessel bypass on him. Now, if I knew what I knew now, I'd say, hey, great, you know, let's, let's keep doing this, which is what I do now. But I didn't know that then. And I said, uh, tell me about this diet. And real briefly, I won't bore you, I had a special major back in the dark ages at Yale University where we could 
research anything we wanted for four years and defend a thesis. And my thesis was you could take a great ape, manipulate its food supply and manipulate its environment and prove that you would end up with a human being. And I actually defended my thesis and got an honors and gave my huge thesis to my parents and went off and became a famous doctor. Um, and then when Big Ed, I said, let me look at these supplements. So Big Ed was following what my thesis was uh, in his diet. And then I said, well, let me see these supplements. So I'm very famous for keeping hearts alive for 48 hours sitting in a bucket of ice water for heart transplant. And I put various things down the arteries and veins of the heart to protect the cells. And Big Ed was swallowing these things. And it you know, never occurred to me to swallow these compounds. And then most of them were polyphenols. And so I was a big fat guy, uh, despite running 30 miles a week, going to the gym one hour every day. I had arthritis in my knees. I had to wear braces. I had pre-diabetes, insulin resistance, hypertension, high cholesterol, blah, 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 migraine headaches. And so I put myself on my program. My parents actually had kept my uh, thesis. So I lost 50 pounds my first year. I lost another 20 pounds subsequently, and I've kept it off for now 20 years. So what I started doing was teaching my patients at Loma Linda that I operated on how to avoid me in the future. And I did this for about a year. And people's high blood pressure went away, their diabetes went away, their arthritis went away. And then one stupid day, uh, about 19 years ago, I looked at myself in the mirror on the way to work. And I said, you know, I'm making a terrible mistake here. I should, shouldn't operate on people and then teach them how to avoid me. I should teach them how to avoid me and I'll never have to operate on them again. Uh, which was really dumb uh, because even in academics, a heart surgeon can make a nice living. But uh, teaching people how to eat um, is not a good career choice. Um, so <laughs> tell me about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's really dumb. But so I, I resigned my position uh, and and set up my clinics, and I asked people to every three months, let me draw a bunch of blood work on you that Medicare or insurance will pay for. And let me ask you to eat certain foods and not eat other foods. And let me send you to Costco or Trader Joe's or the health food store and get some supplements. And I want to see what's going to happen. And so over the years, I've looked at over 10,000 people who have taught me, uh, you know, what the results are. And that's, you know, resulted in, you know, three New York Times bestselling books. Uh, the most famous of which is The Plant Paradox. The new book uh, will release one week from today, The Longevity Paradox, How to Die Young at a Ripe Old Age. And I think that's what most of us actually want, but are most afraid of, that we're not going to die young. Um, and, and that's the paradox. Right. So what we see, What we see in this country is, we may actually be having a longer lifespan, but as most of us realize, our health span is deteriorating rapidly. So that's what we're working on. Right. So this message would be very, very well received at Paleo FX, and I'm sure it will be well received at Paleo FX. You're talking to a uh, pretty much your bullseye demographic. But I'm curious as to what your peers think about your take. So, um, you know, it's interesting. I have a lot of doctors that actually secretly see me. Uh, and I've had a, a number of opportunities to lecture to physicians. Interesting, because I came out of academic medicine and continue to publish in academic medicine, 
I publish and do most of my speaking actually at, for instance, the American Heart Association, the European Heart Association, the American Diabetes Association. And I certainly don't publish the party line, but to the credit of some of these organizations, I have had a number of papers accepted um, for presentation and publication. I felt it was far more important for me, rather than preaching to my choir, like at Paleo FX, right. to get in front of mainstream physicians and perhaps convince them that what they've heard from drug companies and big food and big chemical and big agriculture is not working. Um, and that there, there's got to be a better way. Otherwise, if nothing else, Medicare, as we know it, uh, will be bankrupt very soon. Right. Do you think there's any traction from the from the government side and mer maybe the American Medical Association? Is there any traction that will move us closer and closer to what you and I and our paleo movement knows to be true and knows what the real fix is? And we understand that the basics of, of diet and lifestyle and exercise make all the difference in the world. And thank God that we have modern medicine as a backstop. Sure. But, but it seems like we're just from that, from the government side of things in the, in the, in the uh, association side of things, it just seems like we're hitting roadblock after roadblock. Yeah. Uh, you know, sickness is good for business. Uh, right. We have to understand that. And one of the things that I often start my, my talks with, and I may at Paleo FX, uh, many of us remember a famous muckraker by the name of Upton Sinclair. A uh, hundred years ago, he wrote The right. Jungle. And Upton Sinclair had a quote that I just, uh, I think is incredibly important. He said, it's difficult to get a man to understand something if understanding it competes with his salary. Right. Um, and for instance, how stupid is it for a heart surgeon and cardiologist to teach people to avoid heart surgery and stents? I mean, that's by eating. Right. It's really dumb. Uh, and, and that's really what is unfortunately keeping, I think, most physicians from understanding that there is a better way, that we as a physician shouldn't be writing 10 prescriptions for a patient. Um, we should, you know, like Thomas Edison said, you should be writing a prescription for food and then you won't have to write prescriptions. Right, right, right. This, so the, unfortunately, I think this has to come from grassroots. It has to come from people demanding that they're not going to do this anymore. Because, um, I mean, everybody realizes that something is very wrong when, you know, the average 65-year-old that I see has seven prescriptions. Right. And they're, they're healthy. Right, right. And, you know, I, and I think, I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, with the investigative journalist uh, Barbara er, uh Ernreich, I think is her name. She wrote a book a while back, maybe around 2001. It was called Nickel and Dimed in the US. She did investigative journalism on how very hard it is to work uh, a minimum wage job in the US. And she specifically studied um, Vail, Colorado, right? So if you're a bartender or wait staff in Vail, Colorado, you can't afford to live in Vail, Colorado. Right. Um, so she, she, she writes that type of investigative journalism. And she just came out with a new book and uh, I can't think of the name of it right now. It's, it's totally <laughs> slipping my mind. But the gist of this is she's looking at the the uber rich in the U.S. and in worldwide who who's uh, who consider death to be an inconvenience, right? So we're we're talking about this crowd, and I, I think in the common the common view of people who of people who are in the paleo FX demographic, those who want to take control of their own health. I think that, that people like, um, that people like Barbara Earnwright see that almost as tantamount is considering death being an inconvenience, right? And it's not that 
And I think your book, your new book speaks to that, right? It's not that it's not that we want to lengthen life to 200 years and live right. 100 of them just in poor health, just to extend life. It's to really get as much life as you can out of the years that you do have. And I, yeah, that, that's exactly right. Um, you know, in, in my afterwards, um, we're all going to die. Uh, right. Get over it. Uh, but what we what we want to do is, uh, you know, I study 105 year olds, 106 year olds who have vibrant health. Their their brains work. They walk their dogs. Uh, I mention a, a cyclist in France who's 105. He has the physiology of a 50 year old, and he didn't start doing this until he retired in his 70s. So one of the one of the really interesting things is it is absolutely never too late to actually change things around. And a lot of my books, including the new book, profile people in their mid 80s who uh, came to me kind of a motivation. And one of my favorite is a wonderful woman who I met when she was 85 coronary disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, arthritis. And she came to me and she said, I have a daughter, 60 years old, and she's, she's mentally retarded and she's totally dependent on me. I don't want to put her in a, you know, in a home and you got to keep me alive. This is literally how she meets right. me. I, well, okay. So she's now 97 years old. She is on no medications. She used to be a redheaded model when she was young. She now dyes her hair bright red again. She is vivacious. She uh, she dates a young 80-year-old, and she said, you know, I'm thinking I need younger men because the 80-year-old is beginning to bore me, and this is a 97-year-old <laughs> So, you know, and how did she do this? Well, the whole book is about, okay, you change your microbiome, and most people in paleo FX know that. So the microbiome actually controls your fate. And just to give people a teaser, if we look at 105-year-old people who are thriving around the world, and look at their microbiome. Their microbiome has the diversity and specific bugs that 30-year-old people have, whereas most people in their 60s and 70s and 80s have a very limited, very non-diverse microbiome, and they actually lack some of the bugs that we know promote incredible health span. And a lot of the book is, okay, here's what we know. We know exactly how to get the microbiome that you want and by foods and feeding them what you want. And if you get the right microbiome, the microbiome, you are the condominium that your bugs live in. And if you give them what they want, they will spruce up their home and they will take care of your condominium. They'll paint the walls, they'll make sure the plumbing works and, and because you're their home. And so they're invested in keeping you around. And it's actually really exciting that you can spruce things up at any time. It's, uh, it, and it's an interesting philosophical point, isn't it? it how much of us is actually us? Because the microbiome yeah. affects your psychology as well, isn't that right? Absolutely. We, we talk about, so you actually, 90% of the cells that make you you are non-human. And 99% of the genetic material in us is non-human genetic material. So as I talk about in the book, you got to live and work for the 99 percenters and forget the one percenters. The 99 percenters, if we take care of them, the one percent uh, is a piece of cake. Right. And really new research has shown in humans that 
our genome has only about a six to eight percent effect on our health and longevity. And so that means that 92, 94 percent of everything that's going to happen to you is not based on your genome. It's based on the microbiome genome. And take care of them, they'll take care of you. Which is so encouraging in a way, right? Now it's a heavy yeah. responsibility, right? Because you know, with that, with that freedom comes responsibility. But it that is to me and to many people in the paleo movement, that is a the most liberating statement I think that there is. That yeah, that's can. exactly right. right. Um, you know, our fate is actually not in our genetic fate. It's actually uh, tied up with the 99% of genes that uh, live in us and on us. And the whole book is the tricks to take care of your, your microbiome and what I call the holobiome, uh, your skin bugs. And getting back to what you said, our brain, we're now beginning to realize that the gut brain connection, um, most of the things that are going to happen to your brain happen because of what's happening in your gut, not the other way around. Right. It's fascinating. Um, Michelle, my lovely wife, has a question, and she wants to know what, uh, what your thoughts are on fecal transplants for improving gut health. I'm glad you asked that. It, it turns out that back when I was a medical student at the Medical College of Georgia in the dark ages in the 70s, we uh, pioneered uh, um, fecal transplants for what was then called pseudomembranous endocolitis. It's now called C. difficile. And this came about because we started using broad spectrum antibiotics, which were invented in the 70s. And we had no idea that we would kill off our entire microbiome and a few of these bad bugs like C. difficile would grow. So medical students, once a week, we would take a crap in what was called the honey bucket. Um, and we, we would take it to a wearing blender um, the, uh, and we would homogenize this and we would put it in a enema bag and we would give people fecal transplants. This is in the 1970s. Wow. And it cured them. Now, my personal feeling is having done this for a very long time, the vast majority of people do not need fecal transplants. And the reason for this, and I, we can get really nerdy and technical, but, um, in the microvilli in your intestines, there are crypts where a supply of good bacteria and stem cells always lives. And what I've shown in my practice is that if we give those guys what they want to eat and starve the bad guys, that these guys will emerge from their crypts and they're still there. You know, they're just they're kind of hiding. Let's suppose some gang members take over a street. Mm -hmm. the, the citizens are still there. They're hiding, you know, locked behind their doors. But if we can get rid of the gang members, and there's a lot of tricks that I talk about in the book, these guys are still there. And if we give them what they want to eat, they'll come out of hiding and they'll repopulate your gut. So I have not had to use fecal transplants for many, many years. That is very, very telling and amazing i don't know that i've ever heard it put that way and this depending this is not age dependent so no. an 80 year old 90 year old who otherwise lived a uh, hedonistic life eating every uh, every bad food imaginable still same it is it is never too late and you probably saw a paper this past week looking at the effect of exercise and We've known for a long time that regular exercising dramatically decreases your risk of dying. But the new paper showed that people who basically never exercise until late of life, if they start a regular exercise program, will rapidly catch up with people who exercise all their lives and actually have the same fate as if they had never exercised for most of their life. And what that means is this is, you know, it's incredibly empowering. It is never too late to 
to change your fate. And that's what's kind of exciting about all this. Right. And I think it's it's so encouraging for people because that is generally the biggest pushback you get from people who are middle age and beyond. It's like, it's too late. I can't yeah. do anything about this now, which is, as you say, I, I, I don't know it from the from the scientific point of view. I know it from uh, being a trainer in my past life and seeing some miraculous turnarounds from people who you know, have a have a big life altering event, maybe the loss of a child, a divorce, it, you know, something big happened in their life. And it was enough of a shock to get them to totally change their lives after that point. And they did make miraculous turnarounds. It, and it's incredible to see. So it's it's latent in everyone. Everyone has that ability, which I think yeah. is beautiful. And, and yeah, and you know, one of the things I had uh, David Pomeyer on my pro podcast a few weeks ago, who wrote Grain Brain, and you know, he makes a really, really, really good point. Uh, as you know, as all of us knows, Alzheimer's, dementia, and Parkinson's is in epidemic proportions. There is absolutely, positively, no treatment for Alzheimer's, despite twenty to forty billion dollars of investments from drug companies. Right. But it is completely and totally preventable uh, by lifestyle modifications. And as I talk about in the book, we know that, just to use an example, women who exercise on a routine basis, who even carry the Alzheimer's gene, are 90% prevented from developing Alzheimer's by regular exercise. And even if they develop Alzheimer's, the Alzheimer's occurs 11 years later than the non-exercising group. And if, if we had a drug company that says, we have a treatment that's 90% effective against developing Alzheimer's, I mean, everybody in the world would pay, would say, how much do I have to pay for this? And all you got to do is, you know, some specific few exercises that I, uh, I show people in five minutes a day, uh, basically an exercise program that is effective in you know, preventing Alzheimer's. That is fantastic. Um, we have a question. The name of the book that, uh, that Dr. Gundry is referring to is The Longevity Paradox, How to Live, How to Die Young at a Ripe Old Age. And we'll put a link. Um, here in the show notes after we get done with the uh, with the interview, um, and you, you brought up Alzheimer's and uh, the APOE three and four alleles four, four, four. APOE four. Yeah. Um, Michelle, my wife, happens to happens to have that allele, so she's very concerned about that. So, Michelle, did you hear exercise, 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 and then what can she do on the diet side of things? Yeah. So um, I. My practice, uh, I take care of a huge number of people who carry the ApoE4 gene. About 30% of people carry it. And uh, I got to know Dale Bredesen very well because he thinks uh, I have the most knowledge of the dietary treatment of the ApoE4 gene. And Dale Bredesen, for those of you who don't know, wrote The End of Alzheimer's. And I have a huge respect for him because he knows the most about the effect on the brain of the ApoE4 gene. So long story short, in general, and my paleo and keto uh, colleagues don't like to hear this, saturated animal fats are, I think, one of the biggest mischief makers if you carry the four. I also, in my research, coconut oil is a mischief maker for fours. MCT oil is probably okay, and it, it, uh, we could spend an hour talking about why the difference, but uh, in general, uh, cheeses are not your friend with the four, and coconut oil is not your friend. Um, those are kind of the two. Uh, heavy cream is not what you want to be putting in your coffee. How's that? <laughs> right. Um Dr. Dan Stickler, I don't know if you've come across Dr. Dan Stickler. He'll be at Paleo FX this year as well. I, uh, Michelle and I will introduce you to. Uh, and he's of the same mindset. So he has, and he's Michelle's personal doctor. Um, so he has Michelle on a very low saturated fat 
version of the paleo diet. So you could consider this uh, a Mediterranean paleo diet. Yeah. So it's a Mediterranean diet without the grains and without, and that's essentially what Michelle eats as well for the same reasons. And remember, as I talk about in the new book, grains are a negative aspect of the Mediterranean diet right. that are compensated for by the other benefits. Right. And speaking of which, uh, olive oil, particularly for the Apple E4s, I try in all my patients to get them to get about a liter of olive oil per week. That's right. about 10 to 12 tablespoons a day as does David Perlmutter, as do I. And there's some beautiful studies out of Spain looking at memory and the Mediterranean diet. And real briefly, people at age 65 were randomized to get a Mediterranean diet with a liter of olive oil versus a low-fat Mediterranean diet, and they were followed for five years. The group in the olive oil study improved Improved their memory over that five-year period, and the group in the low-fat Mediterranean diet had diminished memory. And we know now that the polyphenols in olive oil actually grow brain cells. So, if I've got the APOE, you know, four, the more olive oil that goes in your mouth, the better. Right, right. Why? Well, now, am I mistaken? That is the same. That is the same allele that would predispose someone to you have post concussion syndrome at a much higher rate. Is that is that correct? Yeah, the it's um, you know again thirty percent of people carry this, so right. it's not unusual at all. Uh, I have people with the APOE three four like your wife in their mid nineties who do not have Alzheimer's, they're bright-eyed and butchy tailed One gentleman who's 96 still runs his company. Um, and uh, the guy's amazing. So it is, you know, the vast majority of people who carry that gene do not develop Alzheimer's. So I wish it had never been called the Alzheimer's gene. Right. But you do, you know, you do have to take steps. Right, right. And knowledge is power if you actually put it to work. Shout out to the Doing Life Better Together group who is watching this through a watch party. How's it going, everybody? Um, so I'm just reading through the comments here real quick to see if I can find any any questions. So someone like me who does not have that particular allele, but who played uh, football his entire life, I was quite relieved to find out I did not carry that <laughs> that particular allele. But for those who may have played, um, I, I did everything wrong. So I kickboxed and I played football. So I had the double whammy. Thank, thank goodness I didn't have the allele. Although someone say, I think you're a little brain damaged anyway, no matter what your, <laughs> what your genetics may have predisposed you to. But but the same still applies, right? I mean, the same that Mediterranean diet with a high uh, reliance upon olive oil. I mean, that's good for everybody, no matter what your genetic. Oh, absolutely. Is. And, yeah, I mean, the more and more evidence of olive oil's ability to build new brain cells is just actually staggering. And it's not the oil per se; it's the polyphenols in olive oil that make the difference. And uh, I mean, for instance, at Gundry MD, I have a the highest polyphenol olive oil that's ever been tested that has 30 times more polyphenol. And that's not, not a pitch for my olive oil, but it's the polyphenols in olive oil that make all the difference. And quite frankly, if the olive oil tastes bitter or if it burns kind of on the back of your throat, that's a sign that it has very high polyphenols. Mm. And one of my, you know, one of my favorite phrases, uh, the only purpose of food is to get olive oil in your mouth. <laughs> I like that. That's a good, uh, that's a good thumb rule. Excellent thumb rule. Well, Dr. Gundry, I've had you on for almost 45 minutes and I think I, I told you it was going to be 15 minutes. <laughs> so I, I, I apologize for sucking up so much time, but this has been so, so very interesting. Is there... Is there any anything else that you would like to discuss? Um, I, how can people find out more about you? That would be the that would be a good question. Well, they you know they can find me at drgundry.com. They can find me at gundrymd.com. 
the new book uh, will launch literally a week from now. Just an interesting, so you can find it at Amazon. But Barnes and Noble is going to have a special edition of my book. It's going to have 10 additional recipes that none of the other booksellers oh. like Amazon will have. Uh, so that's a little secret. So uh, order on barnesandnoble.com or visit your Barnes & Noble bookstore. You're going to see a huge display right in the front of the store with all of my books, but the uh, longevity paradox will be front and center. So it's a little sneak from Barnes and Noble to get you to come through the door and happy to do it. Right. That's a good, that's a very, very good ploy. Good job by Barnes and Noble and, and congratulations uh, to you for working with them. And can you give us a, a, maybe a, a sneak peek preview as to what you'll be discussing at Paleo FX? Yeah, I'm going to discuss really kind of the tricks to make your microbiome keep you alive. And I'm going to tell you what they want to eat. And I'm going to tell you the supplements that will actually improve their health. And in doing so, it'll improve your health. And it's really kind of fun stuff. Uh, just to give you a teaser, I w had the pleasure of knowing Jack LaLanne, who oh, any oh, fitness oh. professional would know. And Jack used to have an expression that if it tastes good, spit it out. And <laughs> what he was actually trying to tell people was you need to eat not for your taste buds, but for what the bugs inside of you want to eat. Now, what I've done in all my books is don't worry, it's going to taste great. But I think Jack's, what he was really trying to get people to realize is we got to eat for them. Right. And they, in turn, will take care of us. Right, right. Well, Dr. Gundry, we are so looking forward to having you at Paleo FX. And uh, you know what? If you could swing by Paul Sullivan's house and pick him up and bring him out as well, <laughs> that would be fantastic. <laughs> we we keep right. trying well, year I, I after year to, to get him out, but uh, he's yeah, you know, I can't wait to talk, to talk to him about this. Yeah, because I see him all the time. Right. Well, twist his arm. Tell him we really want him to uh, really want him to come out. We love Paul Sullivan, um, and we love Paul Sullivan at ID Life. And I know if the uh, you know, if the Paleo FX crowd met him, they would love him as well. He's just a fantastic gentleman with a fantastic story of his own. Um, yeah, yes, it's a it's a great uh, it's a small world that uh, that you know him as well. That's fabulous, fabulous. Well, Dr. Gundry, thank you so much for taking time out of your day for uh, coming on to speak with us, and we'll let you go and uh, recover from your long uh, trip back from Ethiopia. And kudos to you for doing that. Seriously, believe it or not, I hit the ground running. I've been seeing patients. Uh, I see actually see patients seven days a week, even Saturdays and Sundays. Uh, I'm a nut. Well, and the reason I see patients is because I learn from my patients every day. Every right, day. right. And if you don't mind me asking, how old are you, sir? Uh, 68, almost 69. Um, and look at so, you, still, right. still running like a young one, still working like a young one. That's the power of feeding oh, yeah. your mitochondria well, isn't it? That's exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> Take care. Of All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Gundry, and uh, everybody out there in Paleo FX land and ID Life land. Thank you guys for coming on and watching, and uh, we'll talk soon. Dr. Gundry, cannot wait to meet you in person at Paleo FX. It would be great. Thanks for having me, and we'll see you soon. All righty. Bye bye. Bye.